Hello everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. My name is Ian, you're watching Big Rock Moto, and a big happy new year to everybody. So if you can believe it or not, it's already 2022. And for 2022, there are some really exciting new adventure motorcycles that I wanna walk you through right now. So here's what I've done. I've gone through countless articles and researching online, and I've picked out what I think are the five most exciting, most innovative, most uh, attractive and capable newly designed or majorly redesigned adventure bikes that you can buy starting around this time of year in January, um, but starting with the 2022 model year. In some countries, you may have gotten these bikes a, a year early, but remember that I'm in the USA, so that's how I'm counting the years. So here are the bikes that I've chosen that we're gonna go through today. The Ducati Desert X, the KTM 1290 Adventure R, the Triumph Tiger 1200 Rally, the Husqvarna Norden 901, and the Aprilia Touareg 660. Now you might be upset that your favorite adventure bike is not on this list, but keep in mind, I had to choose bikes that one, had really legitimate hardcore off-road capability because a lot of you in my audience really want that, and two, they needed to be new or majorly redesigned for 2022. So bikes, for instance, like the Honda CB500X received some new suspension updates, but it's not an overhauled bike, it's not a new model, it's basically a carryover with some minor tweaks, so a bike like that is not on this list. Now, if you have questions about any other bikes, please put them in the comments below and we'll follow up on those. And if there's any other of these list type videos that you'd like to see, let me know and I will consider making them. Now, as we start to go through this, I'd really like to know which one of these bikes is most exciting for you. So put that down in the comments below and we can have a discussion about it. So why don't we start off with Aprilia's Touareg 660. Personally, I think this is probably the most interesting of all these bikes. So let's look at the price. It's 11,999 US if you want the base color. I think they do like a gold and black or a red and black. If you want this blue and white uh, with these cool colors, you're gonna have to pay an extra $600 for that. Now it makes around 80 horsepower or 59 kilowatts and 52 foot pounds of torque or about 72 newton meters. That places it just slightly above something like Yamaha's T7, which comes in around 75 horsepower, and quite a bit below something like KTM's 890 Adventure, which comes in around 105 horsepower. Now the weight, the weight is really interesting. So they seem to have targeted the Tenere 700 with this because it weighs exactly 450 pounds. That's fully fueled, ready to ride, wet weight. That's about 204 kilograms. Now, the reason that weight is interesting is because it carries quite a bit more fuel than the T7, which might be its closest competitor. So the T7 has around 4.2 gallons. This bike has 4.8 gallons or 18 liters. So you're gonna be able to get, assuming they get similar mileage, a little bit more fuel range, which is something that is one of my big complaints on the Tenere 700. So Aprilia have done something very interesting and uh, really good with this bike. So what they've done is they've taken, they've designed the engine to be compact. So one of the, another thing I don't like about the Tenere 700 is the engine is really tall. And what it forces Yamaha to do is push the gas tank up really high, the seat height up really high, and you still don't have class leading ground clearance. Now what Aprilia has done is they've made the engine very, very compact. So what they are able to do is give you a lot of ground clearance or room under the engine for passing over obstacles on the trail, but they also were able to push the seat height down to 33.9 inches or 860 mils. And they were able to keep the gas tank relatively low, at least compared to the Yamaha. So some of the journalists who've gone and ridden this bike, me not being one of them, because I don't get invited to press launches, uh, but they've reported that the center of gravity is pretty low and it handles a lot better than something like a T7. Now it's probably not gonna be quite as a low center of gravity as something like the 890 because it doesn't have that saddle style fuel tank that the KTM does. So you're looking at nine and a half inches of suspension travel on the Aprilia or 240 millimeters. That's very competitive right up there with the 890 Adventure R. Uh, you've got nine and a half inches of ground clearance, which is extremely competitive or 240 mils. For the electronics, so let's start with what it doesn't have. It does not have an IMU or inertial measurement unit. So it doesn't have one of those fancy six axis sensors that measures the pitch and the acceleration of the bike to help adjust the ABS and traction control when you're leaned over and in different uh, situations. But what it does have is adjustable traction control, adjustable ABS, it has ride modes, which you can program different settings. It has cruise control standard and you get an optional quick shifter. 
So with all of that tech, this really sets it apart from the T7. This is what you're paying the extra for. The T7 just has switchable ABS, and that's it for the technology. It even has an old cable throttle. So you can't get cruise control on the Yamaha, you can't get traction control, you can't get a uh, quick shifter, but you can do all that on the Aprilia, which is really, really nice to get that. And I really think a 12 grand US, I think that's a pretty reasonable, pr reasonable price for what you're getting. Now, there are some major limitations that some people are gonna face when looking at this bike. The main one, and kind of the elephant in the room, is a dealer network, and that's legitimate. Uh, where I live in Southern California, I'm lucky that there's a number of Aprilia dealerships within a couple hours of me. However, for many of you in the USA or around the world, that's simply not gonna be the case. Uh, the fact that it's a very limited uh, dealer network and support network compared to some other manufacturers that might be more mainstream, that's gonna be very, very limiting and it's gonna limit the amount of people who purchase this bike. So what I'm interested to see is if this bike becomes like a niche bike that only a few people buy and is gonna become almost collectible later on, or if it's gonna face more widespread adoption. I'm really interested to see that, but let me know what you guys think down below. Would you buy one of these even with a very limited dealer network? So let's look next at Husqvarna Norden 901. This is also one of the most exciting adventure bikes and there's been a lot of buzz about this bike ever since a prototype was released. Gosh, it's been two or three years now, so they teased us for a long time, but it's finally in production and hitting dealerships uh, with the first few models exactly uh, right as I film this video. So, um, Here's some news I have for you. I actually placed a deposit for Norden 901 a couple of months ago. I wanted to be one of the first uh, people in the US and one of the first moto vloggers worldwide to get my hands on a Norden 901. So I've decided to buy this bike for Big Rock Moto for the channel uh, and be able to test it and ride it extensively um, throughout the, at least the next 12 months, if not more, if I end up really liking it. So that's really exciting. I'm really fortunate to be able to do that and share all that information with you. I'm gonna be one of the first to have this bike in my hands to do honest, independent, real world testing that goes beyond just a little quick test ride video they did, I think in South America with the, with the uh, big moto journalist. So really, really excited about that. I should have the Norden in my hands in the next couple or few weeks. So stay tuned for that. I'm gonna have a lot of exciting content. The reason that I decided on the Norden was simply because you guys told me through the poll that I put out there on YouTube with almost like 5,000 people responding to that poll and the Norden came out on top both times I did the poll. So uh, thank you guys for your input and I can't wait to get my hands on this bike. So the price of the Norden is 13,999 US. So it puts it between the KTM 890 Adventure and the Adventure R. I think it's a very pretty compelling price point, but you'll see that here when we go through some of the features and specs. So yes, it does share the engine and the chassis and a lot of components with KTM's 890 Adventure. However, to simply call it a reskinned 890, I think that is not doing this bike justice. Husqvarna has greatly reworked uh, the package overall. So the most striking thing, of course, is the visuals. The aesthetics are all different, and I think it's one of the most amazing looking adventure bikes to ever come out, but that's personal. That I mean, styling is just a personal thing, but I'm really, really happy with the styling. They've also, if you look at Husqvarna as a company, I won't get into this now, but they, they do a little bit more in the fit and finish and fine details and overall packaging than KTM does. So KTM wants to get bikes to the market and beat everybody else uh, with innovation and ride performance, uh, they wanna beat everybody else to the market. Husky takes a bit more time with the platform to really polish it and refine it. And in my opinion, that's what the KTM 890 and 790 has been missing. That bit of refinement, of, of finishness, of being more polished, um, having a bit nicer aesthetic and better fit and finish. Um, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that that's what the Husky brings to it. Based on some of the first ride reviews and other videos I've found out there, I think that may be the case. So it has 105 horsepower, 77 kilowatts, or 74 foot-pounds of torque, and 100 newton meters, which is the same as a KTM 890. Now the weight has gone up a little bit over the 890. It's added around between 10 and 15 pounds, depending on what magazine you read or what test you read. Uh, that's to be expected. They've redesigned the fuel tank. They've added a full upper fairing. It has a different windshield, a bigger headlight. Um, so a gain of 10 to 15 pounds is uh, not something that should be a deal breaker for anybody and is something that I was expecting. 
So one thing that I was surprised by with the Norden is that they redesigned the fuel tank entirely from the 790. It's the same saddle style fuel tank, which keeps the weight uh, nice and centralized and nice and down low, which is a huge advantage it has over other bikes. But they've reduced the size just slightly, so it carries exactly five gallons of fuel or 19 liters compared to 5.3 gallons of fuel on the KTM 890. That's not a big difference, so you're probably not gonna notice too much in the real world. My experience also with the 790s and 890s is they get excellent fuel economy, way better than you would think. Um, I usually get 55 to 60 miles a gallon on those bikes. So if that's the case, we're still gonna be looking at a really, really impressive fuel range of over 250 miles. So another thing that they've changed over the KTM is the seat. They've uh, brought the seat down a bit versus the R model, of course, because the whole bike's a little bit lower, lower suspension, which we're about to talk about. Um, but it's real similar to the KTM 890 standard adventure model. Now, it is a two position seat. I think this, uh, what I'm listing here is in the low position, I believe. It's uh, 33.6 or 853 millimeters. What they've also done with the seat is made it wider and made it super comfortable. The journalists have reported, and journalists normally don't mention comfortable seats in reviews, but what I noticed is in their reviews, a lot of people talked about how comfortable it was um, and that it's really impressive compared to the KTM. So that's great news because I'm definitely a comfort oriented rider uh, as opposed to just performance, and I want that comfortable seat for long riding. Now, the suspension travel. So they went exactly halfway between the R model KTM and the standard. So it's about the same as the Yamaha Tenere 700 at about eight and a half inches of travel, or around 220 millimeters. Sorry, sometimes I say mils. I don't mean to say mils. I know that's incorrect. I know I should be saying millimeters. Uh, the ground clearance is really, really impressive on this bike at almost 10 inches of ground clearance or 253 millimeters. That's a lot more than something like the Yamaha T7 and very close to what you get on the KTM 890 Adventure R. In terms of electronics, you have a full suite of electronics, including an IMU or inertial measurement unit. You've got adjustable traction control. And I think for an extra couple hundred dollars, they will install what they call the Explorer software. It's just the same thing as the rally mode on the KTM. First of all, I'm annoyed that they're charging you $200 just to unlock a button. I think that's stupid. Uh, they should just include it. Uh, but KTM charges extra for the quick shifter, for the cruise control, and the rally mode. So at least KT at least Husqvarna, sorry, gives you all that standard. Um, the only thing you have to pay is a little bit of extra to get that Explorer mode. The reason why you should get the Explorer mode is it allows you to change between uh, nine levels of traction control as you're riding. And that's something that if you've ridden the 790s and 890s, is a huge asset to that bike. Having such a fine tunable uh, traction control is a, an amazing thing. And definitely I'm gonna be making sure that they install that on my Norden when I pick it up. Uh, you've got ABS, of course, switchable for different modes. You've got riding modes. You've got cruise control standard. You don't have to pay extra for it. And you have a standard quick shifter. You don't have to pay extra for that either. So really good job Husqvarna doing that. And of course, the wheels are the same as the 890. It has a 21 inch front and an 18 inch rear. And it has the same brakes and a lot of the same, um, you know, same chassis uh, material as the KTMs do. So like I mentioned before, this is more than just a reskinned 890. That doesn't do the bike justice. Uh, is it gonna be a more polished version of the KTM? I'm banking on that. I put my money where my mouth is and I bought one, I've ordered one, so I hope that it is. And we've already mentioned all this stuff. It comes standard with a lot more stuff than the KTM. So I'm really excited about this bike, but let me know if you guys are too. So next, let's look at another European bike, the Ducati Desert X. So. This is a 937cc twin cylinder bike. Of course, it's Ducati's uh, famous V-twin or 90 degree twin cylinder. Uh, you're looking at 110 horsepower or 82 kilowatts, 68 foot pounds of torque or 92 Newton meters, uh, which puts it up there pretty high. That's very competitive, a little bit more power than something like a KTM 890 and is getting close to some of the larger adventure bikes. Now, in terms of the weight, it's not gonna be the lightest weight bike, um, but when you look at the size of the bike, the size of the fuel tank, the size of the engine, that's to be expected. So you're 492 pounds or 223 kilograms. So the fuel tank is very interesting. What Ducati has done is they've given you a 5.5 gallon tank, the front tank standard, but they also sell a two gallon or 2.1 gallon auxiliary tank that you can put on the back. I'll put a picture of it here, but it's a Ducati accessory, factory accessory that brings you up to 7.6 gallons of fuel. So in liters, this would be a choice of either 19 liters or 28 liters. So I think they're going after kind of the whole GS adventure idea uh, with a larger fuel tank for long desert crossings, which 
I mean, frankly, most people aren't going to use this bike for, but anyway, it's there if you want it. Now, the seat height is 34 and a half inches or 872 millimeters. You're looking at nine inches of suspension travel or 250 millimeters. You've got a full suite of electronics and you should for the price because if I didn't mention the price, it's $16,800 US. So that is uh, definitely on the premium end of the midsize or quasi full-size adventure bikes. It's putting it right there kind of in line with the Triumph Tiger 900 Rally Pro. And I think that's probably this bike's closest competitor. So you've got an inertial measurement unit, you've got traction control, ABS, of course, all customizable ride modes, cruise control, and a standard quick shifter. It also has 21 inch, 18 inch rear wheels. So when we're looking at the Desert X, I think it competes really closely to the 890 Adventure R and also the Triumph Tiger 900 Rally Pro. You've got that really cool optional fuel tank, which makes this bike really unique. And the other thing, this is Ducati's first legitimately off-road capable bike in a very long time. I don't know about the rest of the world, but in the US, um, Ducati had the multi strata for a long time, but that was a street bike. I mean, it had 17 inch wheels, and even when they added the Enduro version with a 19 inch wheel and put spokes on it, it's still really, there weren't many people who were daring enough to take it off-road. It wasn't really designed too great for that, although like three people will argue with me on that. But this is Ducati's first time of really putting out a legitimately capable off-road adventure bike. And I'm super excited about it. I think it looks amazing. It's gonna sound amazing being a Ducati. It's gonna have a ton of character. Um, yeah, so I think this is a really, really interesting option. Let me know what you guys think about it, but I'm super excited to get a ride on one of these bikes. I think it, it's gonna be the full package. So the next bike on the list, you guys have sent in a lot of questions and comments to the channel about this. There's a lot of internet buzz about this bike. So in a nutshell, Triumph is going directly, and I do mean directly after BMW's GS, R1250 GS, I should say, with this bike, and here's why. If you look at the pricing, you look at the specs, the features, it all lines up almost exactly to the GS, with a few exceptions, which we'll talk about. So you've got two models here. You've got the Rally Pro and the Rally Explorer. The difference being, if you think of it like a standard GS or a GS Adventure, you get a bigger fuel tank, you get a few more features with the Explorer model and the price goes up as well. So you're looking at 22,500 for the Pro or 24,200 for the Explorer model. Now you're getting Triumph Signature three cylinder engine, but just like they did with the Tiger 900, and if you notice this bike looks like a Tiger 900 at first glance, they've given it the same engine treatment by changing the firing order from the old three cylinder. So they've made it more grunt and more tractable, uh, low in the RPM range and for off-road riding. So it's not gonna be that top end screamer that the old triples were, but it works much better off-road as I've shown in my Tiger 900 review. So you're looking at 148 horsepower or 110 kilowatts or 96 foot pounds of torque and 130 Newton meters. So in terms of horsepower, that puts it about halfway between the R1250GS and something like a KTM 1290 Adventure or a Ducati Multistrada. Um, so that's very good on the horsepower. The torque at 96 foot pounds is very, very strong. Still not quite as much as the 1250GS or the Multistrada or the 1290, but really, really close. Now, in terms of the weight, the weights line up almost exactly with the BMW GS. Some people are saying it's lighter, but that's actually not true. I don't know where that information is coming from, but if you have any insight into that, let me know in the comments. But the weight is exactly lining up with the GS. Uh, at 549 for the standard or 575 for the Explorer, uh, or 249 and 261 in kilograms. Now, you might be saying, wait, the GSA is 590 pounds. Yeah, but the GSA comes standard with luggage racks and a whole set of crash bars, which the Tiger Explorer does not. You might see the Explorer and some of the photos with those things, but you have to add those things and that's gonna add weight to bring it up equal to or even more than the GS. So keep that in mind, it's not any lighter than a BMW GS. So I think I just wanted to put that out there because a lot of misinformation about it. Um, now, in terms of the fuel it carries, it's exactly the same as the GS. So 5.3 gallons or 20 liters, or on the Explorer, you get the big 7.9 gallon tank or 30 liter tank. So exactly the same as the BMW. You get a 34 and a half inch seat height with this adjustable, that's 875 millimeters. You get 8.7 inches of suspension travel, which is 220 millimeters, which is uh, the same as you get on a GS Adventure. 
and very, very competitive for a big bike like this. You've got a huge 9.8 inches of ground clearance or 250 millimeters. You've got a full suite of electronics as you would expect. You've got an inertial measurement unit, traction control, ABS, ride modes, cruise control, a standard quick shifter, and you've got something that BMW doesn't have, which is blind spot radar to detect vehicles or bikes in your blind spot. Now it doesn't have radar cruise control, which is something that is starting to come out on a few motorcycles out there. What you also get on the Tiger, just like you do on the BMW that it competes with is active suspension. So BMW has something they call dynamic ESA. Tiger has their active suspension, which is actually similar to the Showa EERA suspension that I tested and really loved on the Honda Africa Twin Adventure Sport. So stay tuned for more info about this on the Tiger, but that's really, really exciting that it gets that Showa active suspension. You can adjust, you can customize it a lot through the uh, dashboard and it works very, very well in my experience on the Honda and I'm looking forward to trying it out on the Tiger. Of course, what really makes this bike unique compared to many adventure bikes and puts it right in line with the GS is the shaft drive. A lot of you, and I know this from the comments, you really want a shaft final drive because you don't have to oil it or adjust a chain. It's less maintenance. It does add a little bit of weight and you can't change your gearing, uh, but for touring there's nothing like a shaft drive and that's one of the reasons that I have a GS. So I wanted to point out that the Tiger is really unique in a lot of ways, but one of the ways is that it's the only shaft drive bike with truly off-road friendly 21 inch, 18 inch rear wheels. Uh, the GS has a 1917 wheel set, which is really good on the street, but off-road, it doesn't quite go over bumps and rocks and things quite as good as this bike will with these larger wheels. You've got really premium features on this bike. You've got things like lighted switch gear, which BMW has still yet to do. You've got heated seats, you've got the radar blind spot, you've got active suspension. So you're not gonna be wanting for any tech. For this price, you're gonna get everything with this bike. So if you want something that is truly, truly over the top in every way, you can look to KTM. They've updated the 1290 Adventure R. There's some really good videos about this bike out there already. Uh, my friends over at uh, Mad TV or Motorcycle Adventure Dirt Bike TV have been doing videos on this bike as of some other European journalists. So go check out those channels. Um, we don't have the bike on in the US yet. They've released the pricing and we should be getting them in the next couple of months, but I haven't actually seen one. They're not at the dealers yet here in the USA. This bike is a little bit crazy because it's combining super high-end street performance with a crazy 160 horsepower or 119 kilowatt motor with 102 foot-pounds of torque or 138 newton meters, combining that with off-road level suspension and an off-road tuned chassis and the low-slung fuel tank that KTM has been using on the 790 and 890. One of the complaints about the 1290s in the past is that they were really top-heavy and a bit intimidating to ride and get on and off, uh, and that was true. Uh, but what they've done is they've done an amazing thing by doing the saddle style fuel tanks, just like you see on the 890, getting that weight down lower. So this bike comes in at $19,500 US. It weighs 550 pounds or 249 kilograms. So I was kind of hoping that this might be like a lighter weight alternative to something like a GS or Multistrada, but it turns out that there's a price to pay for all that performance, all that big engine, all the technology and a big fuel tank. And the weight is the same as 1250 GS. Now it carries 6.1 gallons of fuel, which is a really nice amount of fuel, kind of in between uh, some of the smaller fuel tanks and the larger fuel tanks on the other bikes, or that's 23 liters. It has a 34.6 inch seat height. They've dropped the seat height just under half an inch from the previous bike. I don't know how much difference that's gonna make, but hopefully you'll notice it. That's 870 millimeters. It's also got 8.7 uh, inches of suspension travel or 220 millimeters, so a legitimate uh, amount of travel there. Now keep in mind, this is the R model only I'm talking about. We're not looking at the uh, street-oriented S model, which um, gives you the smaller wheels for the street, lower suspension, and some added tech like uh, radar cruise control. We're not talking about that bike because this video is just about the really off-road capable bikes. Now you've also got a full suite of electronics as you would expect. You've got an inertial measurement unit, you've got traction control, ABS, riding modes, cruise. The quick shifter is optional, which I thought was kind of weird. I thought that would have made it standard at this price. You've also got keyless ride, which I don't think KTM has done too much before. So that's interesting. So that means that you won't have to put the key in the ignition or the gas cap. You can do those things with just pushing a button and keeping the key fob in your pocket. And of course it's got 21 and 18 inch front wheels. 
And this bike, although it uses this kind of the same engine as the previous 1290, it is a Euro 5 compliant engine. Um, they've also moved it around in the frame. They've reworked some things with the engine and the chassis. So it's gonna handle a lot differently. Uh, they've done a lot with the bike to make it feel lighter and handle better. And so don't think it's just a slightly revised version of the previous bike because it's almost all new when you look at it. Now, if, like I mentioned, if you want things like an active suspension or radar cruise control, you're gonna have to go down to the less off-road oriented S model to get those things. So that's it. Those are the five bikes I wanted to go over. Let me know which of these bikes you're most excited about. And if the bike you're excited most about is not on this list, um, please put that down below because I'm gonna be making more of these list style videos because frankly, in the winter with feet of snow outside and icy roads, it can be a little bit difficult for me to get out and ride. Um, I've got a lot more cool videos coming up that are kind of this style of list. We're going to be looking at the best adventure bikes for beginners, the best adventure bikes for shorter riders, um, for those of you who have problems with the tall seat heights on so many of these bikes. We're going to be looking at sort of a list of the lightest and easiest to ride or smaller adventure bikes, or we'll be looking at that. So I definitely have a lot of cool content in store for you uh, throughout the winter, but I will, I do have riding videos that I filmed previously and I will get out between storms to film more riding videos and more bike reviews uh, coming soon. So stay tuned for that. So thank you so much for watching. I appreciate everybody who supports your channel. I really sincerely do. If you wanna support content creation like this, you can support me on Patreon. You can subscribe and hit the bell, leave a thumbs up, leave a comment. Uh, consider buying my merch like this sweater I'm wearing, which will be available right below this video. And also please remember to shop for your parts and riding gear at Rocky Mountain ATV MC, which uh, a small percentage of those sales will go to support the channel. So. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. I hope this was useful and informative. Uh, let's have a discussion below. I think this is gonna be a really lively topic. And uh, yeah, other than that, we will see you on the next video. Please ride safe.